All right, good morning, everyone. A couple seconds here. Check one thing. I have my dog with me today. Um, he, you guys have probably met him by now. He's pretty funny. He um, just likes to be near people, but he hopefully will just sleep through this. So I wanted to just quickly, all right, sorry, something popped up, okay. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the live Q&A. We're gonna first talk about the difference between adaptation, habituation, and compensation, because I got quite a few messages about this over the weekend morning. Um, and then we're also going to t discuss bilateral vestibular hypofunction because that's been a big question lately and I feel like not enough people address it. I know that I mostly address vestibular migraine here. That's because, and some nears and other things obviously, but a lot of vestibular migraine because that's what most people um, who follow me ask me questions about, but I've been getting a lot of questions about these things this week. Um, and then I got a lot of questions in the questions box. So I'm gonna try and run through them as quickly as I can. I do have to see a patient after this. So um, whatever we have time for, we have time for. You can always DM me and ask me questions. As always, remember, I do not give medical advice here. If you need medical advice, please go to your doctor. Don't delay seeking treatment or change your course of treatment because anything that I say, everyone is different. This is just educational information about vestibular disorders, how they work, how they don't work, uh, facts, myths, etc. I know there are a lot of new people on this page lately. Um, so hi, my name is Dr. Madison Oak. I'm the owner of The Vertigo Doctor and um, Oak Physical Therapy and Wellness PC. I am a vestibular physical therapist and that's pretty much all I talk about all the time. All right, let's get started. So we're gonna first quickly touch on adaptation, habituation, and compensation. So um, a different PT, not me, her name is Sonia Boven. She's excellent, posted on this. So I wanna give her first credit for making this post. And then I got a lot of questions about it from my followers afterwards because I reposted her um, Instagram. But first, her credit goes to the post that was originated. Obviously, she didn't invent adaptation, habituation, and compensation. That's been going on for a long, long time, but I did want to give her credit for the awesome post. If you had, haven't go gone to look at it yet, it's on my story and obviously on her profile. It's all in your head PT and instead of spaces, it's periods. She's great. So first let's talk about the definitions and the differences between the two most confusing ones and that is adaptation and habituation. Compensation is sort of in its own category. So adaptation and habituation are a little bit confusing and they say, seem really, really similar. So first, adaptation is a neural change versus habituation is you getting used to something. So a neural change means that you form a new path of neurons in your brain to make a change. So again, a change in your brain is an adaptation. Habituation is just you getting used to something that happens. So let's take BPPV as an example of this. So um, that can be treated two ways. It's a mechanical problem. So it's sort of a bad example. We'll do a couple examples, but it's sort of a bad example because instead of creating a neural change to fix the problem, you're actually gonna have a mechanical change. So that's the one where those ear crystals slip out of the otolith organs in your ear and they slip into the semicircular canals. And if you need a picture of that, it's all over my website. If you just Google vestibular system, it's all over the internet. So. That can be changed with an Epley maneuver, which is not a neural change, it's a mechanical change where we roll the ear crystals back into your otolith organs where they belong. Habituation exercises would be a series of exercises where you lay down, sit up, lay down, sit up, lay down, sit up, until you get used to the room spinning when you change positions. That's a habituation. Let's take vestibular rehab exercises. So. Vestibular rehab is the process of retraining your brain to respond to something correctly. So again, this is retraining your brain, therefore adaptation. So your brain can form new neural pathways to say, okay, I am now going to not respond in the same way. I'm going to learn that if I move my head really fast, I no longer need to get dizzy. 
Dizzy is an error signal. So everyone has a dizzy error signal. If I, a person who spins their head all day long for work, spun in a circle seven times, I would be dizzy. If you think of a little kid, they will spin and spin and spin and spin and spin and lay down on the grass on a sunny day and kind of watch the world go by, right? The, the sky starts to spin, the um, clouds start to move, all of those things are normal. It's the same as pain. Everyone has a pain threshold, a pain tolerance. Some people's are lower, some people's are higher, but it's an error signal and it's a normal error signal. So you should get dizzy and you should have pain, those are the ones we're using, at some points in your life, right? You fall over, it's painful. It's supposed to happen. You spin in too many circles, you get dizzy, it's supposed to happen. When you have a vestibular dysfunction, you probably can spin in half of a circle and you might get dizzy. So that's a decrease in that neural function. Adaptation would be increasing your brain's ability to have a, a higher response or a higher threshold to that response. So right now you might be down here and say, okay, I can spin in half of a circle and I'm gonna get dizzy. But as you do more and more vestibular rehab and you can spin in a full circle and then one and a half and then two and go around and around and around a circle is just the best example I can do right now so as you do that more and more and more your brain becomes adapted to that rather than habituated to that you can do it via habituation if you have something like a bilateral hypofunction where it's just not going to really um re build the nerve obviously because there's nerve damage there however your brain is still relearning that this is our new normal so your brain relearning a new normal versus you getting used to something is habit adaptation versus habituation we can kind of go more into that if you have more specific questions but it's sort of a brain change versus a bodily response change um so yeah, that's kind of the best I can do. It's a it's a very odd concept, I know. What you have to know, really, is that adaptation is better than habituation. That's what we want. We want our brain to relearn. But if you plateau, you're just like, my brain cannot learn this thing, then you can repeat the same movement over and over and over and over and over again until your brain or until your body is just like, okay, I don't care anymore. That's a little bit different, but I know it's it's a weird concept compensation is different so compensation is the third um section or category we talk about when we talk about rehab so that this category is changing the environment or your lifestyle around you in order to suit your needs so compensation would be like you're going to the grocery store you haven't done vestibular rehab yet, so the visual vertigo might still be bothering you. So you wear your migraine glasses and a hat and earplugs. That's a compensation. You hold on to your cart extra tight. You wear really flat shoes so that you um, your show heel so you don't trip. You bring a cane or walking sticks with you. Those are compensations versus a habituation or adaptation. So hopefully that is helpful. That's the best I can do here and now with the time we have. Um, I know adaptation and habituation can be hard concepts. I remember in PT school, I had a really hard time on tests with those two things. Um, do know, again, brain change versus body change. Adaptation is better than habituation, but sometimes we just have to do habituation and that's the best that we're gonna do. So um, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. The next thing I wanna talk about is bilateral vestibular hypofunction. So bilateral vestibular hypofunction is when you have both sides of your ears have that hypofunction. So hypo means decreased and function means function. Hopefully we all know that word. So at baseline, both of your vestibular systems fire like this. And they say, I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward. That should happen all the time to all people across the board. <clears throat> When you have a vestibular dysfunction, it's usually unilateral. What we mostly talk about is unilateral um, dysfunction. Someone just asked, yes, this is always available on replay. It's either on my IGTV or you can watch it on YouTube. Um, if you don't already subscribe to my YouTube, there's like so many videos of vestibular things on there anyway, um, but you can watch it in both places. Okay, so unilateral hypofunction. 
if you have a unilateral hypofunction, then let's say I have a right lesion. This is my right side. I have a right lesion. Then my vestibular system is firing like this. Okay. So it's still firing forwards, but this side's firing less than this side. Okay. At baseline, when you turn one way, let's say I turn my head to the right, this side fires more and this side fires less and vice versa. You kind of go back and forth all day long and your vestibular system says, okay, that's where I am in space. If I have a bilateral vestibular hypofunction, you look like this. So that's when both sides decrease. So there's usually less lightheadedness and dizziness in these cases because your brain doesn't think that you're spinning one way or the other. Your brain just doesn't know where you are in space. There's usually some dizziness and lightheadedness, but it's more imbalance and feeling like you're gonna fall over all the time, which is a little bit different. So um, what I wanted to touch on here are things to help you treat bilateral vestibular hypofunction and kind of what causes it. So let's start with the causes. Typically, what causes BVH is a, an ototoxic medication. So I wrote some of them down here. Um, gentamicin is, of course, an ototoxic medication. Usually that is uh, given for Meniere's disease. If it's just something that is really recurrent, it can happen for some people. They, it's an injection you put in your ear, so it's usually localized to one side. But if you have both sides, then of course you're gonna have bil bilateral. Um, some cancer drugs. So if you've gone through uh, any form of chemotherapy, um, if you've had chemotherapy drugs, that can cause a bilateral vestibular hypofunction because it's an ototoxic medication. Um, common ones are cisplatin and carboplatin. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I did not study oncology, but that's the best I could do. Then some antibiotics, specifically aminoglycoside antibiotics. Those can be ototoxic. Uh, azithromycin, commonly known as a Z-pack, that can be ototoxic depending on you. And then things like NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like Tylenol, um, uh, acetaminophen, but those are the same, uh, ibuprofen and Advil, those are the same. Um, things like that, those can be uh, temporarily ototoxic. So those you can find will might give you like tinnitus. Um, make you feel a little bit funky for a little while, but those aren't permanently ototoxic like these other drugs are. So um, that's typically what happens with uh, that. It can also be genetic. So you might just be born with bilateral vestibular hypofunction. You can get really sick and you can get this. Um, things like, uh, I think like meningitis is something that can cause this. It's really dependent on you, but <clears throat> be aware, both sides decrease function, okay? Causes a lot of imbalance. So you are going to be at a higher risk for falls, not feeling balanced, difficulty walking, especially in the dark and uneven surfaces, difficulty standing on uneven surfaces, not really knowing where your head is in space. The treatment for this um, that I find most important is strength training and balance training. So things like gaze stability, so that's where you can do it with me, we do this every week, Put your thumb in front of your face, stare at your thumbnail, move your head right and left, your eye should stay still. When you have a unilateral hypofunction, so that's when you look like this, okay, this side is firing more than this side all the time, you can retrain your brain to say, okay, this is normal. We're not going to regrow this nerve, but this is now our new normal. That's one thing we can do. However, with bilateral vestibular hypofunction, because they're both not firing all the time, you're gonna have a much harder time with gaze stability. So doing gaze stability training, doing a series of uh, very specified VRT is gonna be something you should do. However, it's not something that's going to be as effective as unilateral hypofunction. So for these people, strength training safely. Uh, vestibular group fit is great for this. So that is very strength heavy training. It's not heavy weights, but it's very strength based. Um, all body weight exercises or like small weights, I use cans. Um, so strength training in a safe way that you're not gonna fall over. Um, some VRT, just like I said before, see how it goes, see if you can make any progress. And then when you plateau, continue with those exercises at home. However, 
um, you are not going to be in VRT forever because at some point it probably will not get to 100%. Um, using a cane or walking sticks if you're feeling really imbalanced, especially if you know you're going to be on grass or something like that. You can also use a walker, but I don't think that's as necessary. Usually a cane or a stick will get you where you need to be. Um, a lot of grounding. So, excuse me, hiccups. My goodness. There's a lot of grounding, knowing where you are in space, using extra proprioception to help you feel more balanced. So, if you're feeling imbalanced, really root your feet into the floor and use as much proprioception as you can. Proprioception, remember, is the way that you feel the floor in the space around you. So if I can touch the wall right here, right, that adds to my proprioception. I'm sitting on a couch right now. I'm comfy this morning. Um, so that isn't as much proprioception. I mean, I'm still receiving proprioceptive feedback, but I might feel a little bit more like I'm moving because this couch is squishy, right? I'm not sitting on a kitchen chair or something like that. Um, wearing shoes that have a thin sole, arch support still, but a thinner sole, not like a platform or a heel. Clogs might not be so good for you. Uh, Hoka running shoes, probably not the best for you because they're really, really squishy, right? Anything that's really squishy decreases the amount of feedback that's real from the floor and will make it more difficult to stand. That's why it's harder to stand on a pillow or a mattress than it is to stand on the floor, okay? So wearing shoes that benefit you rather than make your life more difficult will definitely be a good thing. Um, increasing your base of support. So if you stand with your feet together, that's gonna be harder than standing with your feet apart. So doing that um, is good if you're in a tough situation you're like i need to just do anything i can right now to increase my balance make your base of support bigger you can bend your knees a little bit kind of drop down think about how a surfer stands on a surfboard right they they drop down their feet are apart that's how you can think about standing if you're like in, in a situation where i really 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 need a little extra help so then foot health and eye health so taking care of your other balance systems we have three balance systems, right? You have your visual system, the way you see your surroundings. It helps you predict, it helps you where you know where you're in space. You have your proprioceptive system, the way you feel the ground and your surroundings. So remember, I touch the wall, I touch the floor. I know that I am still and not moving. Then you have your vestibular system. If you can't rely on your vestibular system, you have to rely extra heavily on your other symptom, uh, the on your other systems okay so if you're relying heavily on those systems make sure that they are really help healthy so if you are having if you have something like diabetes make sure you check the bottom of your feet every day i mean any kind of person you really should know what's going on at the bottom of your feet but especially if you're diabetic because you can get diabetic neuropathy and that will also decrease the amount of uh referrals towards your brain towards the rest of your body to know where you are in space okay um, if you can't feel the bottom of your feet so foot health is really really important especially in bilateral vestibular hypofunction um, and then eye health okay get your eyes checked wear your glasses um, wear contacts get lasik whatever is right for you but keep your eyes healthy so that you can continue to predict what's around you um, if you start to rely too heavily on your visual system get some help with your proprioception and get some help with the visual vertigo symptoms with vestibular rehab that will actually continue to get better even if like your gaze stability with bvh doesn't get better um any questions about that, you guys can ask in the comments. I'm going to move on to the Q&A. I hope that helps with bilateral vestibular hypofunction. Remember, stay strong, check your feet, check your eyes. Those are the, really the biggest ones for this. Um, I have a couple questions here. Um, this one that got asked first, I'm already going to answer. I had that written down. You asked that in the question box. Um, oscillopsia, the balance is really good. So someone's asking if they're oscillopsy when they move their head in a certain direction to the left side, but their balance is really good in walking and running. Awesome. Um, is this bilateral or unilateral? I can't tell you if it's bilateral or unilateral. You either need a head shaking nystagmus test, a head impulse or head thrust test, or a caloric exam. Um, your two like objective measures that a PT can do, so a head impulse test or a head shaking nystagmus test, those ones, if you have greater than 40% loss on a unilateral, um, then 
you'll be able to see the um, the positive test, I guess, so your eyes shift. Um, but a caloric test really is the gold standard for that on a VNG. All right, so let's get into this Q&A. So the first question that I really wanted to focus on, um, just because it's good for everyone to know, vestibular group fit, does VRT happen in this? So VRT is an individualized vestibular rehabilitation program that is based directly on your needs, okay? That is something that I do on a one-to-one -one basis in people with in certain states, California, Maryland, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, and, um, and Florida coming soon. So, oh, and then Minnesota and Wisconsin as well. My colleague, Dr. Jenna, she takes care of our, all of our Midwestern patients. So if you're in those, any of those states that I just mentioned, we can get you help, okay? However, that is not in group fit. There are exercises to strengthen your vestibular system in there, like visual vertigo training that's not specific. It's just something that you can do at home. There are ways to help you cook without so much dizziness, um, some neck exercises, things like that. And there's more and more coming every week. I'm constantly making content in there. However, it's not individualized vestibular rehabilitation therapy. Okay, those are two different things. It would be illegal for me to give you VRT in that program. I'm very aware of my practice act in each state. I read them very carefully. It is not VRT. It is fitness. It is other things. It is good for your vestibular system. It will strengthen. It will help you balance better, move your head better, go to the grocery store better. However, it is not individualized. You got it, Alicia. <laughs> You're my... I, Mrs. Migrantastic, if you don't follow her, go follow her. She's the best. Okay. Uh, is vestibular hypofunction permanent? So if you are like this and you've had, let's say, a vestibular neuritis, okay? That's the most common, easy to explain one for me. So you're like this all the time. This is normal. This is how a normal vestibular system works. If you're like this, you've had a neuritis in this side, this nerve will not heal. I don't really care what nerve in your whole body doesn't work so well. We as humans we don't regrow nerves. We're not good at it. You can kind of do things and form new neural pathways, but we don't regrow nerves. So yes, you are gonna be like this forever. However, we talked about ad adaptation at the very beginning of this. Your brain is going to reform the neural pathways that say, okay, I'm gonna now learn that this is my new normal. So do it with me. You stick your finger out in front of you. You look at your thumbnail. You move your head back and forth. Okay, your gaze should stay stable. It should stay stable until about this fast. This is 240 beats per minute approximately. Okay, so you are going to relearn that that is your new normal. It is your brain's job to be neuroplastic. If you wanna talk more about neuroplasticity, you can ask me this question or at Rooted Behavioral Education, Dr. Kostalnik, she explains this all day long. So um, go follow her as well. Okay. I hope that helps. Yes, a hypofunction is permanent. The symptoms, however, are not permanent. I'm going to go um, down the list that I already have from the question box. Remember, you guys, the question box is always there the day before these. So if you really, really, really want a question answered, go ask that box uh, the day before my live. It always is up on my story. Um, yes, the it is permanent. However, it doesn't mean that you're going to feel badly forever. Okay. It's really, really important to know that because the anxiety of like, oh my God, I'm going to feel bad forever can cause 3PD symptoms um, to occur. So work through that anxiety if that's something that I've made you anxious. That was not intentional. Um, but if you're having that anxiety and you're like, oh my God, this is going to be there forever. It is going to be there forever. However, you know what people, let's say, let's compare it to a musculoskeletal injury. You might have an ACL injury. You're not we, you can't regrow your ACL well, well, there's new research, but you really, in theory, can't regrow it. So we put a new one in there. Your body relearns how to use this new thing, this new uh, ligament, okay? It's the same as that. You're never going to have the original one. However, your body relearns how to do that, how to work with this new piece of equipment, basically, okay? All righty. So tips for in-the-moment vertigo attack. If you're having an attack of vertigo, my number one recommendation would be to do anything you can possibly do to feel calm in the moment. If you're having a true room spinning vertigo attack, a migraine attack, a Meniere's attack, BPPV attack, uh, those are shorter lasting, of course, but any like a vestibular attack, OK, 
okay? If you're having that, whatever you need to do to feel comfortable in that moment to hours long, that's what I would recommend you doing. There's no exercise you should be doing during that time with the exception of if you call this an exercise, grounding. So grounding is the act of finding something firm. It can even be your bed if that's comfortable for you. The floor, lean against a wall, sit on the floor against a wall, um, find a firm chair, things, anything that makes you feel comfortable. Sit and feel how still you are. Breathe through the moment. If this makes you feel comfortable, it really does help kind of bring the anxiety levels down and bring the dizziness symptoms down. So you can do box breathing, which is where you imagine a box, okay? So imagine a box in your head, you breathe in for one, two, three, four, you hold, two, three, four, you breathe out through your mouth, two, three, four, and in through your nose again, or hold for four, two, three, four, and then in. So it's in, hold, out, hold, in, hold, out, hold. And that helps some people. For some people, it's like, I am in the middle of an attack. I cannot focus on anything. Um, sometimes it's helpful to focus on something. Sometimes it's not helpful. It is totally up to you. It's after the attack. That's when you kind of start rehabilitating again. But during an attack, if you need a medication, if you need a breathing exercise, uh, any of those things, if you need that, yes, that is what you do. Do some grounding, do some box breathing. That's a good idea. Um, but I would not recommend that you like try to do some VRT in the middle of an attack. That's not a good idea. Um, okay, so why are my symptoms worse in the winter? So if you live in a place where you have really big weather fluctuations and the barometric pressure changes, you can Google your city and then AccuWeather migraine tracker. Okay, Google that after this is done. Um, and you can look at how the weather, the pressure of the weather kind of fluctuates like this. It's usually somewhere in the 30s, at least like in the States. Um, and when that changes it's the change that's a problem rather than the actual pressure itself that's a problem so your brain doesn't like change migraine brains hot brains they don't like change so if you are if the weather keeps changing and you're having a storm then it's kind of warm and then it's raining and then it's snowing and the weather is getting warm and cold and warm and cold especially in the fall um that is why your symptoms might be worse can bright light trigger dizziness? So bright light for some people is a migraine trigger. Um, however, it's not necessarily a dizzy trigger, How, but it can also be a visual vertigo trigger. So there's a lot of reasons it could be a trigger for you. Um, if you want to try and work with this bright light problem, there are a couple of options. So wearing migraine shields or Therospecs, Avalux glasses, any of those are fine inside. I do not recommend that you wear sunglasses inside. That's actually not a good idea. Sunglasses, they block all forms of light, okay? If you're blocking all the shades of light all the time, your light, your eyes are actually gonna get more sensitive than they were in the beginning. So it's like taking away something rather than only taking away the things that actually bother you. So there's not... A great way to relearn how to be good at bright light or blue light waves certain blue light waves so certain blue light is bothered by people with people with migraine you know what i'm trying to say so if you yeah download migraine buddy is worth the money it's a great download mrs migraine tastic is telling you to do it i also agree it shows the weather changes you can also use a, a accuweather if you don't want to download it but it is a good investment Anyway, um, so bright lights. FL41 lenses, which are the lenses that Migraine Shields, Avalux, Therospecs, they all use. They're all a little bit different color, but it's all the same concept. Block only the kind of light that is going to bother you. Oh, really? I thought it was a subscription. Oh, it's free. Okay, then definitely go buy it. For some reason, it's $60 for me. Okay, I'll figure that out later. That's irrelevant. It's free. Go use it. So... Um, if it's bothering you, wear your FL41 lenses inside because that is only blocking the blue light that's actually bothering you. The rest of the shades are blue light of blue light aren't being blocked there. You need some blue light to help with your circadian rhythm, which will release melatonin at the right time, help you sleep, stuff like that. 
Um, but the light itself, uh, the blue light is the problem. Other forms of light that are problematic, like uh, fluorescent lighting in grocery stores and Target and stuff like that, that can be really problematic because people are like, oh my God, so bright, so loud. There's just stuff everywhere. Wear a hat, wear earplugs, wear your migraine glasses. Do not wear your sunglasses inside. You can wear sunglasses outside. That's totally fine. That's normal to do. Um, but no, you do not have, you should not wear your sunglasses inside. Um, I've also had patients say, I only feel imbalanced when I'm in really bright light. It's kind of the same mechanism. Practice your balance exercises outside without sunglasses on. It really does help. Just, duh, I just discharged a patient like three weeks ago with this problem. She's doing super well. Um, when should we start VRT earlier or later? This is a really, really good question. So you should start VRT at a time that works for you. And I know that's super vague, but it's a vague answer on purpose. So uh, VRT should be started when you're mostly stable, unless you have a vestibular therapist who like wants to walk you through the whole process of like managing your uh, diet, managing your exercise, managing your lifestyle choices, everything like that, and then start VRT. With some patients, I do this. So we talk about triggers. We do like very minimal VRT exercises. It's still in my practice act to do stuff like this. Um, but we talk about like a lot of the education behind it. And when your brain calms down, that's when you should start VRT. So your brain should be relatively calm. You don't have to do any specific like um, exercises at first, but as it's, it's, it's a really difficult question. So um, someone keeps asking me about diet incessantly. So go follow at the dizzy cook if you have diet questions she is the best person to follow for that um so when should we start vrt it is either early or late for some people they've tried it before and it just didn't work for them because they're like it just wasn't the right time my brain wasn't stable my was having constant fluctuations it just made me feel worse a lot of people comment on all of my posts and say vrt is making me worse what's going on it can make you feel worse if you're a person who can like barely move their head back and forth without feeling dizzy. I have quite a few patients right now actually who were like, I've done this before, it didn't work for me, why? We talk a lot about it probably wasn't the therapist, it probably was the fact that your brain just wasn't prepared. Your brain has to be in a state that it's ready to receive information and a kind of calm versus um, just being anytime. Your brain can't always, it's not in a safe place to learn if it doesn't feel safe. So think about that when you think about going to VRT. My best uh, recommendation is just to go to a vestibular therapist who's qualified and skilled and has gone to the extra schooling. A regular PT who hasn't gone to the extra schooling is not someone I would recommend for VRT. Um, get an evaluation, see if you're ready, ask your neurologist, ask your neurotologist, ask your ENT, ask all these people. Um, and, and all of that will hopefully give you an answer. Um, does VRT cure BPPV? Yes, sort of. So BPPV, it's not, it's cured in the sense that like it'll go away and you shouldn't feel, um, you shouldn't feel worse afterwards. So you should be able to do an Epley or a Canalith repositioning maneuver of some sort, some sort of body turning maneuver. Um, and that should go away. If it doesn't go away within, I'd say max four sessions, look into if you're doing the wrong maneuver, if your eye movements are actually moving the way that they should in that position, um, and if you have an underlying condition that's causing it to recur. Things like Meniere's disease, vestibular migraine, history of vestibular neuritis, all those things cause BPPV to potentially be recurrent. So if it's coming back like every few months and you're like, I don't know why I've only ever been diagnosed with BPPV, look into an underlying condition. One in four people with BPPV have some form of migraine. So it's good to look into, it's good to be wary of because you can't prevent the attacks by preventing the other attacks. Um, if, however, you're someone in the same vein asked about if your BPPV is getting worse or is, is gone, like the vertigo, the room spinning feeling when you lay down, that's gone but you're still having imbalance, if that's happening, I would say that you just need extra rehab or you should look into an underlying condition. So that's all good. Your um, your like room spinning has stopped. You can lay down, you can sleep, whatever. Um, if 
but you can still feel like you're imbalanced, just do extra VRT or look for an underlying condition that could be causing this to recur. Um, in that case, you can treat both of the things. If you're doing extra VRT, balance exercises, walking with head turns, y'all know is my favorite. Um, all those things will definitely help. Um, can people get over vestibular issues 100%? So people do heal from vestibular disorders. Absolutely. People here heal from everything from MDDS, BPPV, VM, 3PD, you name it, people heal from it. It really is dependent on if you have the right set of treatments for you. It's really a holistic thing. Um, you can't just take a magic pill and it'll all go away. That is not how we treat vestibular disorders. You probably need an ENT, a neurologist, a neurootologist, a vestibular PT, a psychologist or and or a psychiatrist, um, maybe a personal trainer or some support groups, all those things. There are so many things that you probably need in order to heal a vestibular disorder. It is a commitment. It is effort. I understand that 100%. It can be really, really tough to get through this, but people, yes, you do heal from this um, when given the accurate treatment. Um, does VRT really regrow neural pathways? Yes, uh, we talked about this at the beginning. Um, habituation and adaptation. Adaptation is a thing that regrows new neural pathways. Remember, we're not regrowing nerves. We're, re we're retraining the neurons to fire accurately when you do the things that make you dizzy. Okay. Why does vestibular migraine increase cervical tension? So you have your first like classic migraine mechanism is via the trigeminal nerve. And that looks like this in your face, tri meaning three. So one, two, three branches of this nerve. You then have a trigeminal cervical complex and that complex causes tension and pain all the way down here. And then you have another complex that's your vestibular cervical complex which also increases the tension. So that kind of, those three things kind of make an awful triangle and um, it can also, it increases cervical tension. Additionally, um, if you are, um, if you are like having cervical tension because you're not moving your neck, that can be another problem. So neck stretches, chin tucks, really gentle exercises. There is some research to show that neck exercise can make migraine worse. But I think I didn't, I need to go back and read the study again, but I would assume it's um, exercises that are like really tough on your neck versus like things in your upper chest, upper back, and like deep cervical muscles, um, which PT specifically give you um, that increased the pain versus sp specific exercises for you. If you're going to a PT, you should not be given a general program. You need to be individualized how to increase light sensitivity tolerance. I kind of answered this before. I should have grouped these better. I'm sorry. Um, stop wearing your sunglasses inside, uh, wear your migraine shields, do it really slowly. You can use things like the Iris app on your Chrome, which will, um, decrease the blue light output. and will also, uh, turn your screen off every 20 minutes for 20 seconds to help you with light sensitivity. Um, that's one of those more difficult things to work on though exercises to decrease neck pain and stiffness any stretches so you can kind of stretch your neck like this like this like this like that any of these directions will stretch different parts of your neck um chin tucks are great pec stretches are great lower back or mid back exercises so you have a really large uh, muscle on your back it's kind of shaped like this um the bottom part, your lower trapezius muscle is usually really weak and your upper trapezius muscle, which is this one, which everyone always tells me is tight, is, is really tight because it's overused a lot of the time. So if you can strengthen the lower part of that muscle and stretch the upper part of that muscle, a lot of the times that really helps with the neck pain and tension. Um, how to get back on track after with VRT after being sick for a long time. So if you're sick, whether it's vestibular sick or like I got COVID or I got a cold or I got the flu, whatever, um, whatever you got after doing VRT, it's kind of like going back to the gym, right? If you were doing like 20 mile runs and you were lifting really heavy weights, squats and deadlifts, the whole nine yards at the gym and you just came back from being sick, you're probably going to progress back to your baseline pretty quickly, but you probably shouldn't go on a 10 mile run and then squat 150 pounds, right? It's probably not a good idea. You would think about that 
um, with your muscle musculoskeletal system let's think about it with our neuroplastic system as well so you probably haven't regressed as much as you think um, but start really slow do really gentle head turns do some neck stretches stand on the firm surface with your eyes closed before a foam surface with your eyes closed stand with your feet together and your eyes open before feet together eyes closed all those things will be really helpful um so do facial and head decrease sensation okay this is a long one with non-spinning vertigo no neurological issues i would assume that meant a negative MRI, um, no blood test issues. I'm assuming that means that you had all your blood tests done um, be caused by nerve compression or VM. So I'm not giving medical, this is not medical advice, but this is a good question because I actually get questions about non-spinning vertigo with decreased facial sensation all the time um, without any other problems. So first of all, I wanna mention that if you have VM, it is really likely that all your testing is gonna come back completely negative. Like your VNG is probably normal, your MRI, your CT, your blood tests, and every X-ray, brain scan, I don't care what you get scanned, it'll probably look normal. And that is this oddness of migraine. It is probably one of the most, if not the most complex problem in the world. So all of these things will probably look normal, but you're like, I feel really tangly, tingly in my face, in my neck, in my head. If you think about it, this trigeminal nerve, this one right here, this one is the one that causes uh, the, the classic like eye stabbing or jaw stabbing pain in migraine, right? So if you're having paresthesia, which is a decrease in sensation on your face and in your neck, that's probably from that nerve right here, okay? Um, it can be caused by the facial nerve or the trigeminal nerve. If it's your facial nerve or your trigeminal nerve or your vestibular nerve, fun fact, they're like this with each other. They literally run like, like this in through your brain. They're so, 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 so close um, to each other. So all three of those nerves do like sensory and motor feedback think I should check on that before I just blurt out saying that but it will make you feel paresthesia sometimes so um because of it can be because of nerve compression if some, you have something like an acoustic neuroma um so that's a compression on your um on your ear nerve so your vestibular cochlear nerve um or it can be vestibular migraine both of those things would be good guesses they do have different diagnostic criteria obviously one is caused by a benign tumor the other is caused by migraine um very very different problems but they can present really similarly so um definitely test if you feel like oh maybe i have an acoustic neuroma your hearing will probably be a little bit different um and you will probably have um like a decrease in hearing let's say and um some other kind of wacky symptoms. You can obviously look up the uh, diagnostic criteria on the internet. Someone just said, uh, I had all these exact symptoms and my uh, all normal testing and my VM is my diagnosis. So super common, just like I said. Um, and then the last part of this question was, I feel this vertigo, but I don't know if it's vertigo or if it's dizziness. It can be vertigo, it can be dizziness. It depends on the sensation. Remember, vertigo is the incorrect perception that you or the room around you is moving, sliding, or spinning. So we typically talk about true room spinning vertigo, which is when you see the room literally move around you. It's caused by nystagmus, which is involuntary eye movement. So involuntary eye movements, they um, look make the room look like it's moving because your eyes are, of course, moving. It's most common in BPPV. It also happens in veneers. It also happens in vestibular migraine. It also, it also, it also, it just happens all over the place. Um, however, the rocking and sweating sensation we refer to as non-spinning vertigo. So there is a distinction between the two types of vertigo, spinning and non-spinning vertigo. The rest of it is dizziness, okay? Dizziness is our big umbrella term. All right, I can do one more question. Let's see if there's a one that I get often. Okay, this is actually a good one. So I have whiplash concussion two years ago, tried all all sorts of things, but always being pulled back from vestibular stuff, even though they said I have BPVV. I pre presume vestibular is good for everyone, even if injury or not. Okay, so this, again, this is not medical advice for you. But this is a common question that I get. I do like this question. So whiplash concussion, 
every concussion has a whiplash aspect. However, I think in this, uh, in this specific question, this person is asking about like a concussion that kind of goes like this versus your head being hit. Your, your brain is like being jostled in your skull. So that's a whiplash concussion. So if you have this kind of concussion, you can get dizziness symptoms just like anyone else with a concussion. Um, if you are getting room, if a person with this is getting room spinning dizziness, when you change position, that's BPPV. Anything else is pretty much not BPPV. There are some instances where you don't get room spinning dizziness, but it is BPPV. You do need the nystagmus. It doesn't hurt to try an epley with your PT, not by yourself. Um, if you think you might have BPPV, because it can't hurt. Um, but other than that, if you're like, oh my God, I just feel dizzy when I do stuff, it's all about threshold. So concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and your brain needs to readapt just like every other vestibular problem to your new normal and also rebuild the neural pathways. So in concussion, we, it's a really multidisciplinary approach. You probably need a speech language pathologist, an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, a medical doctor, um, all kinds of things. Oh, my light just went out over there. Okay. Um, you probably need a practitioner from every line of work. Uh, because there are so many multi multidisciplinary needs for someone with a concussion. Just speaking on the vestibular part of it, a person with concussion that has dizziness, uh, you shouldn't be pulled out of vestibular rehab because your vestibular therapist should be able to accurately grade your um, concussion symptoms and your specific needs. If you want to follow someone who talks about a concussion more than I do, three people, they're Canadian, I'm obviously not Canadian, but three people who are Canadian are great, are all in your head PT, uh, Thrive Neurosport and um, Natasha Wilch. All three of them are great. I think I might be missing a couple, but those are the three that come to mind. They're wonderful. Um, they treat a lot of concussion. If you have specific concussion questions, I would go and ask them. They treat more than I do. I do have some, but they do more than me. So that's great. Um, if you are being told you don't need vestibular therapy because you just have BPPV, A, that's wrong. That's a person that should treat your BPPV and B, they're probably wrong. So if, again, if you're having BPPV, you every single time you change position, okay, that's probably rolling over, sitting up, looking up into a cabinet, looking down under a table, something like that you will get room spinning vertigo for 15 to 60 seconds. It will take about 10 seconds for it to happen and then it will stop and it won't happen. It's really terrifying for sure, but it won't happen again until you change your head position. So if I look up into the cabinet, it happens. I look down, it should be okay. But if I do it again, it's probably going to happen again. That is not anything else. That's BPPV. So know that when you're looking at symptoms, if you're like, oh, you have BPV, now it's gone, but you're still dizzy, please go back to the RT. All right, that's all we have time for today. I have to see a patient in like 10 minutes. Um, this was a long one today. You guys had a lot of really good questions. Remember, if you want your question answered next week, please put it in the question box. I do. I can't scroll up anymore. You guys asked too many good questions. So um, please put them in the question box. It will always be there the day before uh, my live, which is always going to be on Monday or Tuesday, unless I tell you differently. Uh, that information will always be on my stories. So if you're missing my stories, scroll to me. You can turn on notifications on my profile if you want to be notified every time I post. Um, but yeah, so definitely subscribe to those. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you don't already. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can always DM me or ask me in the question box. All right. Bye guys. Talk to you soon.